Hi, and thanks so much for joining me today for our Get Ready class online. Um, we're doing this a special version for the internet because of the COVID-19 response that's causing us all to do social distancing. So I've missed a couple of Get Ready classes, so we're gonna go ahead and take it out there on the internet. My name is Lori, I work at the Tiburon Police Department. I'm the Emergency Services Coordinator for both Belvedere and Tiburon. Um, and it's my honor to teach the Get Ready classes. Uh, this program actually started after Hurricane Katrina. And we had a resident, Tom Cromwell, went down to New Orleans to give medical assistance to the people there. And he came back after his experience and he told stories to, to the community about what he saw. And what he saw was that people were, were suffering, they were dying because they weren't prepared to take care of themselves. They didn't have the supplies they did, needed, they, didn't have first aid training, um, and so they were perishing. And the first responders themselves weren't able to take care of as many people as needed help. And in a lot of cases, they weren't able to even go to work because they weren't prepared themselves at home. So that's how the Get Ready program was born. Basically a group of people from our community here in Belvedere and Tiburon got together and they developed this simple program, which is just all the information that you need so that you can get yourself, your home, your family, your car, your workplace prepared for any disaster, for any emergency. Um, it's a really adaptable program so that you will know how to take care of yourself if you're sheltering in place or in the rare occasion of evacuation due to fire um, evacuation. So before I get started though, I just wanna point out this picture of the Tib Tiburon Peninsula. I really love how this illustrates how isolated we could become. Um, we have two routes in and out of the peninsula. So over here we have Tiburon Boulevard and on the back side we have Paradise Drive. Should anything happen to those thoroughfares, we're going to be isolated. And even as it is now with just those two roads, during school traffic um, or during any kind of Caltrans work on Tiburon Boulevard, the traffic becomes so bad it almost feels impossible to get out. Well, imagine in an emergency situation, the road just not moving because it's congested. We're not gonna be able to get in or out very easily and resources that we need will not be able to get in and out. So this picture just really beautifully illustrates what we could be up against. So let's start out with a hypothetical. Let's imagine that 45 minutes ago, we had a significant earthquake on the Hayward fault line. The Hayward fault line is the one that goes through the East Bay and it actually has a strange history of having a significant earthquake every 140 years, going back to the year 1315. Um, and the last one was 1868. So some say we are overdue for that significant quake on the Hayward Fault Line. So this is very likely that it could happen. And what's gonna happen in the Bay Area? It's gonna severely impact our roadways, our infrastructure, all of our bridges, our hospitals. A lot of people could be injured um, or, or even die from this. 101 could be closed in all directions. Tiburon Boulevard um, is gonna be impacted. If we had a tree down or any kind of a landslide, that could completely shut down our roadways. That could leave motorists stranded. We could have hundreds of people injured um, and lots of accidents. Hypothetical, what Paradise Drive could look like. And here's a house in Belvedere that shifted off of its foundation. So ask yourself, in that situation, how are you going to get home if you're not at home? If you are at home, do you know if your house is safe to be in? Do you know how to evaluate it? If it's safe to be in, do you have all of the supplies that you need? Do you have food? Do you have water? Do you have first aid supplies? Uh, do you know where your utilities are? Do you know how to check to make sure that your, your gas is not leaking, that your water is not leaking? Um, what if you're not with your family members? This is a whole nother disaster in my book. If you can't find your loved ones, if you can't communicate with them, um, that's, that's going to make you feel terrible. So you really want to make sure you have some kind of a plan for if your kids are in school, your spouse is at work, and you're, you're not all together. You want to make sure you can get back together or at least communicate with each other. You need to have a good plan in place for at least the next five to seven days. So if you can't answer all those questions, you've come to the right place, it's time to get ready. Um, so if you don't already have a Get Ready book, you can find this on the internet, download it at the Town of Tiburon website or the City of Belvedere website. The Get Ready manual is going to contain all of the information that's in the slideshow and everything that I talk about today, plus more. It's full of a lot of really good information. So get yourself a booklet. Um, and right now I'm just gonna walk you through it. So on the slides behind me, you're gonna see section one. It's gonna cover before the disaster. 
There's gonna be page numbers up here. That's all gonna coincide with stuff in the manual. So section one in the book is gonna cover preparing yourself, your home, your family, your neighborhood, and we really do encourage people to work with their neighbors. Um, you know, especially right now when we're in the middle of a pandemic, helping your neighbors out is so important because a lot of seniors especially are people that have access and functional needs. They're feeling really stuck at home. It's not safe for them to go out to the market. So working with your neighbors to help each other out is so, so important. So if you have neighbors that might be stuck at home and could use a little help, um, now's the time to give them a call and, and work together so we can all get through this safely. So according to the US Geological Survey, we have, it's up to a 99% chance of having that significant earthquake somewhere in the state of California, either southern or northern, but we are gonna have that significant quake in the next 20 years. Here on the peninsula though, we also have a history of localized fires and floods, uh, severe storms. Just last year, we had some very serious landslides that took out roadways and utilities and threatened homes, something we face every single year. Um, we all know fires have become a really scary thing in Northern California year in and year out, so we need to make sure we're prepared for, for fire season. Um, and right now, we're in the middle of a pandemic, and the same information applies um, for, for all of these disasters. Be prepared to shelter in place and ride out any of these storms. So what can we expect from that, that significant earthquake on the Hayward Fault Line? Well, first off, your emergency officials are going to be overwhelmed. Um, we only have a handful of firefighters and police officers on the peninsula for a population of about 10,000 people. So they will be overwhelmed. And most of our emergency responders don't live in Belvedere and Tiburon. They live outside of the county in many cases. So it could take them some time to get here. So we really need people to, to take care of themselves, prepare for themselves as best as possible to give us time to get our people together. Um, our roads, our bridges, they're going to be damaged or congested and it's going to make travel very, very difficult. Our health facilities will become overwhelmed and we're seeing this right now uh, in the middle of a pandemic as our hospitals will become overwhelmed and while they do have plans in place, every person that's prepared to treat themselves or give first aid attention to their, their friends and neighbor nearby, that keeps somebody out of the hospital and makes room for the really critically injured people. Um, Water and food distribution is going to be disrupted. We're not going to be seeing Cisco trucks coming down to the grocery store stocking our shelves. You know, right now in the middle of this pandemic, because so many people rushed out to prepare at the last minute and get the supplies they needed, our shelves are empty and it's taking a while to get everything restocked. That's the kind of thing we could face in an earthquake. Um, so having the essential supplies on hand is, is really crucial. So, so get yourselves ready now. On a personal level, you might not be able to get home for several days. If there's a large earthquake, the bridges could be closed, um, at least for a while until they're inspected. So if the bridges are closed and the roadways are congested, it could take you some time to get home. So you want to make sure you have a plan in place. What if you've got children that are home alone or pets that are home alone? Is somebody ready to go over and, and feed Fido if you can't get there or to watch your kids? Um, if your home is seriously damaged or destroyed, do your loved ones have a plan on where to go? This is a time to work things out with your neighbors and come up with that plan ahead of time. Um, someone that you know could experience serious injury or death. So you really have to plan on every scenario how to be a survivor. So the first and most important thing to have in your kit is gonna be water. A person can survive for weeks without food, but only days without water. Water is the most crucial thing to have. So when you're putting your kits together, um, you want to make sure that you have at least one gallon of water per person per day for everybody in your house and don't forget your pets. If you've got dogs, cats, hamsters, snakes, whatever you have, make sure you have food and water for them as well. So you want to make sure you have bottled water um, that's in some kind of a good sturdy plastic container. So if you're having one gallon of water per person per day, I want five to seven gallons of water for everybody in your house. That's a lot of water. That would be a lot of little bottles. So look at your home, uh, your family size, and ask yourself, okay, how much water do I need? What's the best way to store that quantity of water? So if you have one person, maybe a couple cases of water is good, but if you've got a family of four and two dogs, you're gonna want a much larger quantity of water. So there are different options. Um, this is what five gallons, if you have a water cooler, this is what five gallons of water looks like. That's what you want to have minimum per person in your household. There are options out there 
large drums of water that'll hold 75 or 85 gallons of water. You can stick those outside. They have siphons. There's a water preservative that you can put into the water to keep it good for, for five years. And that's a great option for larger size families. Um, it's what the library has, it's what the schools use, it's what we have here at the police department. So you might look into the, the larger receptacles. Your bottled water will last for one to two years. Most bottles of water will actually come with an expiration date either on the bottle or on the casing itself and it'll tell you when it's good by. My general rule of thumb is just give everything a year. Your food and your water after a year, put it into your, your, your food supply in your kitchen and go through it and use it and replace it once a year. Uh, it makes it a little bit easier to remember so you're not checking dates constantly to see what needs to be replaced. Uh, my favorite thing to do is in the beginning of May, the Postal Service teams up with the food bank and they will pick up your food and water supplies that are non-perishable. They'll pick them up from your mailbox and the postal carrier takes it and takes it to the food bank and they'll feed the needy. So then I go down to Safeway with my, you know, my list of everything that I need to replace. I get all that stuff, I keep the receipt, and now I've got a tax write-off because I just donated the equivalent to the food bank. So it's called Stamp Out Hunger Day. Once a year, I believe it's the second weekend in May. Um, I just take all of my food and water from my emergency kit and put it out, and Maria, my mail lady, picks it up and takes it to the food bank. Makes it really easy, and it's a tax write-off. Um, but your food and your water both need to be replaced. There's a couple of ways that you can get some emergency water um, should you not have enough bottled water on hand. One is your water heater. Your water heater has 30 to 50 gallons of drinkable water in it. So you wanna make sure that you know how to use your water heater. Um, they do take a little getting used to, so go out there and get to know it. Once a year, you should actually flush water from your water heater because let's pretend this is your water heater. Your water heater sits there day in and day out and it gathers a little bit of, a little bit of sediment at the bottom of the water, which is it's funky. It turns kind of gray and murky. So you want to flush that out once a year so that the water is always clear and drinkable. Because in the event of an emergency, you're gonna draw water from the bottom, from a tap or a spigot or a faucet at the bottom of your water heater. You turn it on, water comes out into a bucket and you can use that to drink. But that's where all the gooky stuff is. When you use water from your water heater, for your shower or your kitchen sink, it draws water from the top where the water is always clean. So you never see that funky stuff at the bottom. It comes from the top. So once a year, go and flush out a little bit from the bottom until the water runs clear. Uh, once it runs clear, you turn it off and the water heater refills itself back up again with clean drinking water. Um, this will also keep the water heater longer alive alive longer um, so it, the bottom doesn't get corroded and rusted out so you don't have to replace your water heater as often and they're expensive so good tip uh, hey while you're taking your food out to the mailbox and and donating it to the food bank the second weekend of may maybe that's a good time to flush your water heater do too just have that one day a year where you just replace everything and flush that water heater um, make sure if you're storing water in your garage, if that's where you're putting your emergency water supplies, don't put this out there by gasoline or petroleum products because that will actually seep through plastic over time and then you have gasoline flavored water and that's no good for you. You can also purify water if you have to use toilet water or creek water. There's different ways to purify water. There's a recipe in the book on page five, how to use drops of bleach, um, four drops of bleach to a quart of water, um, you take the bleach, put the drops into it, and let it sit, and that will actually purify water. Make sure if you're using bleach to purify water that you use generic, unscented bleach. You don't want lavender-scented um, perfumes in your, in your water. It's not good for you. There's also different kinds of tablets out there. You can get in any camping section, um, REI, places like that, Amazon tablets that you just drop into your gallon of water and it will, will purify drinking water. Lots of supplies, good disaster preparedness supplies, come from camping sections. It's kind of the same thing. Imagine you're gonna be camping out at home for a week and that's what you wanna have at home. Imagine you're not gonna have electricity and you're not gonna have all the luxuries of home. You're camping at home. That's what you need to get. So camping sections are great for finding supplies. Your food supply. You wanna make sure that you also have five to seven days worth of food. Um, when you're picking foods for your kit, there's so many different options out there. I like to put foods in my kit that I actually like to eat. So while there are lots of good emergency foods, like these bars here, these are great bars, they will keep you alive, 
they'll keep you full. They don't taste great. Um, they're a little, they're a little on the scary side. Um, you just eat a small amount and it expands in your belly and makes you all full. So that's great. This is perfect for a car kit. Worst case scenario, you're on the side of the road. You know, it's, it's great for that. Is this what you want to be eating at home for a week when you've been through a traumatic event, when you're scared, when, you know, things are, are upside down, you want to put some foods in there. I think that you enjoy eating. Um, so for me personally, and this box has been around, I'm a big fan of the Twinkies. They meet most of the criteria. You want things that don't require cooking, don't require water. Um, and these are actually low sodium. So they're perfect. Really. They keep for quite some time, but seriously put food in there that you enjoy. Um, you know, tuna crackers, granola bars. If you put canned food in there, make sure you put a can opener in there. I know it seems crazy because everybody says I've got a can opener in my kitchen. If we have this major earthquake, when we have this major earthquake, imagine what's going to happen in your kitchen. All the drawers are going to come out and fall on the floor. So the can opener and the knives and all those sharp utility or utensils are going to be on the floor. All the cabinets are going to open up and all the things on the shelves are going to come out, fall on the floor, broken glass. Do you want to go through knives and sharp things and broken glass trying to find your can opener in that scenario? No, put it right there in your kit, right with the canned food, everything one place easily accessible so you're not rummaging through debris or any hazardous situation. Um, make sure that your food supplies meet all the requirements of everybody in your household. If you have infants and you need formula, make sure it's in your kit. If you have pets, make sure that you have you know, the, the pet food in your kit. Canned vegetables and canned fruits contain a lot of liquid water. Um, so there's another source of, of drinking water. Um, so make sure, like I was saying, make sure that you store everything in one place that's easily accessible. This is going to be different for everybody because it's going to depend on your home. Where is the best place for you? So, in my house, I actually choose to go on my back patio. I have a very large tub. Everything's in the tub out in the back. It doesn't get too hot. It doesn't get too cold. Make sure that it's airtight, that it's going to keep the rain out and that it's going to keep out the bugs. You want to make sure that no insects can get in there. The rain water is not going to get in there. And around here, it's those raccoons. You got to watch out for the raccoons. They get, they're clever. So make sure you have a good container if you're putting your stuff outside that's going to lock and keep the raccoons out. Um, buy, a, buy an entry or exit door in your garage, some place that's going to be easy to, to get to from inside or outside. So think about where you want to put your kit. Easily accessible. Um, even though my kit is outside, I have toilet paper in my kit outside. And just in case, I still put my toilet paper in large Ziploc bags just to keep it waterproof. Batteries also, put them into a Ziploc bag. So things like this, just seal them up so that they are extra waterproof, things that you don't want to have get damaged. So in addition to having your kit at home um, that contains all those essentials, you also want to have a good kit in your car and at your workplace. We're on the road so often and traveling around in our cars. What if we do get stuck 15 miles from home when this earthquake hits? You know, we're going to need to have some essentials in our car. What if we have to leave our car and walk? You want to make sure you have a good kit in your car so you have the things you need to walk those 15 miles. So have a good backpack. Um, I personally really like to have a nice discreet backpack. Just a plain black um, is what I go with. If you're walking down the streets of downtown San Rafael or downtown San Francisco, this is going to be nice and nondescript. A lot of the emergency disaster kits that are that are sold out there that are pre-assembled they're bright red and they say like disaster supplies or emergency kit and if you're walking around with that I think you're advertising that you have what somebody else needs so think about your car kit what are you putting it into small fanny pack discreet backpack be smart about it um, you want to make sure in your car kit that you have the things you would need um, if you should have to walk or if you are stuck in your car for, for a couple days even. So think about what you would need. For me, I need sturdy shoes. Um, I need sunblock. I need a ball cap. You know, things to protect my face and my feet when I'm walking. You want to have some cash on hand. ATMs might not be available if the power is out. So you might not have access to cash. So having some cash in your car 
If you are gonna put cash in your car, I highly recommend hiding it somewhere. You tape it inside your glove box or someplace discreet, maybe not in your kit, um, because cars do get broken into and kits and backpacks get stolen. So you don't wanna lose cash if you have it in there. Um, back to safety, if you are walking home, try to find a group of people walking in the same direction. Um, you know, get loud. Hey, anybody walking down to Southern Marin wanna get together in a group? Find some other people to walk with because there is safety in numbers. Um, I always carry pepper spray. You know, if you're comfortable doing that, maybe have pepper spray in your kit just because disasters do bring out the best in some people. They step up and volunteer, but it brings out the worst in others. And I don't wanna see anybody become a victim in an already stressful time. On page seven of the book, um, pages seven and eight actually, are some basic lists of items to put in your disaster kits. So page seven is the emergency supplies you would wanna have in your home kit. Personalize this. I'm a big fan of personalizing these kits when it comes to things that you need, those comfort items. So put in a deck of cards or you know knitting needles and, and yarn if you are a knitter. Things that are gonna comfort you um, add to the kit. If you have prescription medications, eyeglasses, um, things for your pets, whatever you might need, you know, really think about this. But here's a list of just some basics and that'll walk you through maybe assembling your kit. Have fun with this though, make it your own, make sure you put things in there that, that you need. Um, page eight has the mini survival kits. This is the kit for your car and your workplace. Um, so use this as a checklist when you're putting together your, your kits. On this page, I love this tip. In the lower right hand corner, it says never let your gas tank fall below a quarter of a tank full. And something that we see with you know the fires that we had in Sonoma County, people that had to evacuate quickly, the lines at the gas stations were so long. Uh, make sure that you have enough gas to get you to safety. So don't ever let that gas tank fall below a quarter full. In this next section, we're gonna talk about how to turn off your utilities, when to turn off your utilities, and how to prepare your house. Um, so let's start with your utilities. You wanna make sure first off that you know where your utilities are. So you wanna go walk around your house and find your gas, your water, and your electric utilities and, and know where they are. And then make sure you have the tools on hand to actually turn them off should you need to. Make sure that everybody in your household knows how to turn them off if they need to be turned off, especially the gas. Um, and teach your neighbors. Because what happens if you're not home and you have a gas leak after an earthquake, you wanna make sure your neighbors turn off the gas for you to protect your house. It'll protect them in the long run too, because if your house should catch on fire and you're not home and the fire department can't get there quickly, their house is right there in the path of, of danger. So they are gonna to wanna to turn off your gas as well. So make sure that you have the right tool out there at your gas meter so that everybody can quickly turn off the gas. Now, you only want to turn off the gas though if you have a gas leak. You don't want to just turn it off just because there was an earthquake. Unless you have a leak, you do not need to turn it off. And the reason why is because once you've turned off your gas, only PG&E can actually come and turn it back on. So if we have a Bay Area wide devastating earthquake and everybody turns off their gas, it could take several days or weeks for pg e to go around and turn everybody's gas back on one at a time. And they're going to be prioritizing schools, hospitals, public buildings that are necessities before they come out to your house. So how do you know if you have a gas leak? You're gonna smell it. The odor that you smell in the gas is actually added to it so that you know if you have a gas leak. So if you smell that natural gas smell, that's when you wanna be able to shut down your, your gas. So you wanna make sure that you attach a gas meter shutoff wrench to your gas meter. Um, they're fairly inexpensive. Make sure you get a good one that's metal. This one actually has a nice little plastic coating to it. Um, so you can leave it outside at the gas meter. So mine at my house hangs from the valve just like this. It's been there for almost 10 years now. It's never been tampered with. It's never, um, you know, kids don't go around and do this as a prank. So it should be pretty safe to leave out there and you want it there so that when you smell gas, all you have to do is go and turn it and shut the gas off. It should be quick and easy. So make sure it's out there, hang it from the valve, tape it to the top, tie it with a string. I've had people tell me they painted theirs bright red and just left it on the ground and it's right there if you need it. So make sure it's out there. 
So this is what your gas meter looks like, and it should be pretty self-explanatory. The, the valve, there's not gonna be too many things. This is the most common, I believe. You should find a valve that's on the pipe, and it's gonna be going up and down in line with the pipe, and that's showing that it is flowing gas, that it's open and flowing gas. To turn it off, all you wanna do is take the, the gas meter shutoff wrench and turn it a quarter of a, quarter of a turn, creating a dam so that the gas will no longer flow. So you're just gonna turn it, quarter of a turn. Now, a lot of our gas meters are older. They get corroded and rusty. You wanna make sure that your gas meter is ready for you to do this, should you need to. So get one of these wrenches, go out and wiggle the valve a little bit. If you can't even get it to wiggle, call PG&E. They will have somebody come out and either fix or replace your gas meter because they want it to work for you as well if there's a problem. So get the wrench, wiggle, don't turn off your gas, just give it a wiggle. If you can't get it to budge, give pg and a call so they can come out there and maintain it for you. So electricity and your water are a lot easier because these you can turn off and then back on yourself as well. So you have a breaker panel in your house, different breaker for every part of your home. Just know where it is and pre-labeling them to each part of your house so you know which part is to which breaker, great idea. Um, just shut it down if you smell an electrical burning smell and call the fire department and then don't turn it back on again until you get the all clear. Your water shut off. There's two places that you can turn off your water. There's the easy way and the hard way and here on the Tiburon Peninsula we're going to recommend the easy way. The easy way is going to be at your home, somewhere at the house, there's going to be a, a valve. Um, sometimes it's a little pulley, little lever that you can just flip over from on to off or it might actually be one of the, the faucet looking things that you turn clockwise all the way to turn off. That will protect your water in your home and keep anything contaminated from coming inside your home. Now out at the street level somewhere, there's going to be the water meter that you can turn off if you have the right wrench and that'll take care of protecting everything from the street to in your home. This is a little bit more complicated. A lot of times the, the valve itself is pretty far down into the ground. so. It's gonna look like this. The wrench is gonna look like this, but a lot of times they're much deeper down, so you need one that's about 16 to 18 inches long. Um, getting this lid off in a lot of cases is difficult. It can be a heavy cement lid um, or a really heavy plastic, and you might need a crowbar just to get the lid off. And then inside here, this is not cleaned out regularly by the water district or anybody. So just for kicks, I went and I took the lid off of mine, and when I pried the lid off, it was a breeding ground for little tree frogs. And they scared me more than I scared them. And either way, I've heard of dead critters, mud, funky stuff, don't even bother. This is a pain. This here will protect everything inside your home. Your water heater that has that 30 to 50 gallons of drinkable water, this will protect all of that. Once you hear that there's no problems with the water mains out at the street level, you can turn this back on yourself. If you have any questions about the utility shutoffs, please feel free to call me or call the fire department, call PG&E. Uh, there are people out there to help you if you have any questions about this. Um, structural hazards. Imagine that your house is on wheels. That is what an earthquake is gonna feel like. So you really wanna do what you can to protect your home, maintain your home, so that it will roll with the earthquake. Losing your home could be your greatest catastrophe next to losing life. So do what you can to protect your house. Most people are not insured for earthquakes because it's expensive, the deductibles are almost unreasonable sounding, and so they just don't. So therefore, you do what you can to ensure that your house is going to be okay. Most of our homes are up on rocky hillsides and they're actually in, in pretty good shape to roll through it. Um, but whatever you can do to help your house perform better uh, can definitely help. So some of the most important things that you can do, just take good care of your house. Uh, ensure its structural integrity by having regular inspections for pest and decay. Make sure you don't have water damage and termites. Make sure that your house is strong. There are actually companies out there that will reinforce your house and the foundation to get it to get it strong, the foundation stronger and deeper into the ground. There are different companies out there, so you might want to look into that. If you are remodeling or rebuilding, talk to our town engineer, city engineer, and they can give you good ideas for how to make your home even stronger. Non-structural hazards inside your house. This is actually what hurts people the most around here. 
Our building codes in California are really good. Um, they're the equivalent of what we see in Japan and, and Oregon, all kind of have the same model of building plans. And we saw in Japan when they had that significant quake years ago, followed by the tsunami, the buildings stood up through the earthquake. It was the tsunami that did the most damage. And, and that was because their building codes are great. Our buildings are very, very similar. They're, they're built strong. Um, they're not gonna pancake down like we saw in, in Haiti and in, in Chile. Um, we're not gonna be looking at buildings pancaking. Our buildings are built to great strong codes. So what's gonna hurt us and those that we love are gonna be the items inside your home that fall down on you and hit you. So you really wanna go walk around your house and ask yourself in every single room, okay, what's in this room that's gonna fall down and, and injure me or a loved one, and then fix it. There's different ways to secure things in, in every room. There's different things that you can do to, to secure it. Um, you're basically childproofing your home, but for earthquakes. So let's talk about that a little bit. First off, heavy objects that you have on the walls, make sure your heavy objects are into the, the studs in the wall. Um, don't have those heavy or glass objects over your bed or your couch, places where you're resting. If you're in bed and you're sleeping and there's a large glass framed piece of art over your bed, you don't even have time to react to get out of its way if it comes falling down. Don't have anything heavy over your bed, soft things only. If you're in bed when the earthquake hits, stay there. It's one of the best, softest places you can be. Throw a pillow over your head and just stay put. As long as you don't have that heavy thing over your bed, one of the best places you can be. Um, on that note, should that earthquake happen in the middle of the night and we lose electricity, um, you wanna make sure you have a flashlight and some good sturdy shoes underneath your bed so that you can maneuver yourself out of your home or around your home safely without cutting up your feet. And that was something that we saw after the Japan earthquake is people were cutting up their feet or even their knees crawling to safety before the tsunami came. And so the broken glass is an issue. So have some sturdy shoes or slippers under your bed and a flashlight. Um, going back to lighting, going back to the supplies, good sturdy flashlights, lanterns are great during power outages. And one of my favorite things is these headlamps. If you don't have one of these in your emergency kit during a power outage, um, these things are fantastic because it frees up your hands to do things around the house. So if you don't have the electricity and you know we are all probably facing the, the public safety power shutoffs every year from here on out to prevent fires, um, these are fantastic to have in your kit and they look really, really cool too. Um, but this way your hands are freed up. So even putting one of these under your bed with shoes, you can maneuver safely out of your house without your feet being hurt and hands free with light. So great item to have. And again, camping sections, any store has things like this. Um, down here on the bottom of the list, fasten water heater to the framing and make sure you have flexible connectors on all of your gas appliances. These are building codes, this is required. So your water heater that you have should already be fastened to the building, to the studs in the wall so that it's secured in there. And you should have bendy connectors on all of your gas appliances. And that way, when the earth starts shaking, it's gonna just bend and roll right with the earthquake. Um, here is a diagram of your water heater, and I know you probably can't see it, but look in the book, refer to it in the book. It's just what your water heater looks like, and it's got a good picture that shows you where, um, where it should be strapped and also all the different components for flushing it and, and everything. So good picture in the book. Securing, like I said, or childproofing your house, one of the biggest recommendations here for securing things is your cabinets. And like I was saying back in the, in the supply chapter, um, when we were talking about supplies, your cabinets will probably open up and the contents are gonna fall out. The drawers are gonna come out and spill onto the ground and everything is gonna break and be a big hazardous mess. So getting those cabinets secured with childproof latches will actually hold the contents inside the cabinets and drawers. So that's one of the best things you can do is just keep all of that glass and sharp objects contained in the cabinets and drawers with those child safety latches. And they take a little getting used to, but well worth it. Um, tall furniture like bookcases and china hutches, these should be secured to studs in the wall. 
You can use angle brackets to secure them at the top, go into the furniture and then into a stud in the wall. You can put bolts right through the back of the furniture if it's solid wood. And then, I don't know about you, but I'm a big fan of collectibles. Um, so all those like trinkets and collectibles and things like that, you wanna make sure they're secure. Because what if you have a bunch of glass vases that come falling down? Broken glass or they could hit you in the head if you're trying to maneuver around. So there are different ways that you can secure the items that are on the tall bookcases or china hutches. At my house, I have big bookcase filled with um, bobbleheads. I collect the baseball bobbleheads. So I got some of, and there's lots of different kinds out there. This is my personal favorite. Um, museum putties, earthquake wax, museum wax, lots of different names for it. Find one you like. I use the, the museum putty and I puttied down each of my bobbleheads, so I've got 100 little baseball players that are secured. Earthquake hits, they're gonna do a lot of this, but they're not gonna fall down. And I had a kitten that tested this to make sure they weren't gonna come down. They are in there pretty solid. So secure all those bases and collectibles as best you possibly can. It'll save you your, your collectibles, but also the potential for injury. If there's any of these things that you can't do yourself to secure the big pieces of furniture, find a handyman, ask a friend or family member, um, but, but you wanna make sure to get this stuff secured. I'm gonna move on to first aid training. Um, there are a lot of different first aid classes out there. The Red Cross offers one. We have a really good one here on the Tiburon and Belvedere Peninsula. It's called FADER. It's the first aid for disaster response. It's put on by the Marin Medical Reserve Corps. And once we are done sheltering in place, get out there and take this class. It teaches you how to do first aid in any kind of a disaster using things that you have in your first aid kit, or if you've run out, things that you have around your house. Great class. So take a good first aid kit and then a first aid class, take a good first aid class and then make sure you have a good first aid kit. So there are a lot of pre-assembled kits out there. Uh, it's gonna have just your basics. I personally liked to piece together my own. This has, has the bare minimum and it's small size things. Um, if you have kids, you probably already know this, but um, Disney Band-Aids work better than regular Band-Aids. Uh, I find that Hello Kitty Band-Aids work best with the kids. Spray Neosporin for children. If you have pets, there's different kinds of pet first aid items, little antiseptic swabs and, and um, kits for pets. So personalize your first aid kit. Uh, these little ones that are pre-assembled, they're a great starter, maybe add to it. This doesn't have any cold packs, add some cold packs to it. If the most common injuries are crush injuries or people being hit from things, cold packs might come in handy. So put together a good first aid kit. Once you've assembled the first aid kit, even if you've taken a first aid class, make sure you have a good guide, a nice simple how to do whatever um, in the kit. So this is a nice little one that came in one of these pre-made ones. They come in the phone book. Next time you get your phone book before you recycle it, in the beginning of the, of the phone book is a nice simple guide. Rip it out, put it in your kit. Because under stress or pressure, if someone that we love is hurt, it's a nice little reminder, okay, somebody's bleeding, I'm gonna go ahead, flip to bleeding, and it's gonna step by step walk me through what to do in case I'm panicking and just can't think straight. So add to it. Um, here's a list on page 16 of the basic first aid supplies. Again, add to this any medications that you might need. Um, again, glasses. I'm gonna be a big fan of having the extra pair of glasses in a kit because if something happens to the ones on your face or contact lenses, have spares because eyesight, we all know how important that is to us. Um, coming up with a good disaster plan for any situation is very, very, very important. So you wanna sit down with your family members and talk to them about what you're gonna do in every kind of scenario. You know, maybe pull out the get ready book and, or just start talking about, you know, what would we do if there was an earthquake and we weren't together? What would we do if there was an earthquake and we were home? Who's doing what? Talk yourself through it and come up with a good plan. How are you gonna protect yourself? If you're not together, where are you gonna meet up? If your house isn't safe, where are you gonna go? If you have to evacuate, what's the plan? Do you have family members you can stay with? Do they know that that's the plan? Come up with those good plans and come up with a plan B for every one of those. 
Communication is always crucial. You want to make sure everybody's ready to communicate with each other. So really talk about, okay, if our cell phones don't work, how are we going to talk? If we can't talk to each other, where are we going to meet up and just know that that's where we go? So you really want to talk as a family and come up with these. Um, in the front of the Get Ready book, there is a disaster plan worksheet that will kind of help help guide you through the through the planning process. Um, on here, there is a 10-minute evacuation list, and this is for use if there's a fire. So you can write down the 10 items you would take if you had 10 minutes before you evacuated. Fire is a mile away. You've got some time, but not a lot of time. So the 10 items that you would take that are irreplaceable and where they're located. So if you, let's say you have um, all of your important financial paperwork, the deed to your house, medical records, those kind of things, if you have a backup copy of those, if you've scanned all those important documents, insurance paperwork and whatnots, and have those someplace off-site or in the cloud, then you wouldn't have to worry about grabbing those and you could put things like the family heirlooms that are completely irreplaceable. Be thinking along those lines and what can you make a backup copy of so that you don't have to worry about losing it. Um, have household drills as part of your planning. Have the fire drills and the earthquake drills. The kids do these in school all the time. So if you were to say earthquake, the kids are all gonna, and I'm sorry, I know you can't see that, duck, cover, and hold. Um, the kids know to do it because they do it every single month in school. And so it's like they've been brainwashed. They have that muscle memory thing going. As adults, we don't do that. And so we're probably gonna do the wrong thing and go running down the hallway and have those items fall and hit us. So the kids are, are smart. As adults, we need to practice at home as well. So have the earthquake drills at home. Next time you're sitting around for family dinner or maybe Thanksgiving or something, you know, yell, earthquake, and drop, cover, and hold, and start teaching the family to do the same thing. Because the more you practice, the more likely you are to just automatically do the right thing. Um, walk around every room in the house. We don't always have the big, large piece of furniture to duck, cover, and hold under. So walk around your house and find the places that are safe. Because you're not going to be able to go far. If the ground is shaking violently, you can't always get to that big piece of furniture. So it's going to be your closest, best option. And that could be a doorway. Um, it could be just an open area away from anything that might fall down on me. So you need to start walking around and recognize where the safe places are, or at least where the unsafe places are. You know, get away from the, the, the microwave that's going to slip off the counter and hit you. Um, have those household fire drills. And the first thing you should do is test your smoke detectors. Make sure that the battery is good and the smoke detector itself is good. Every time you change the clocks, you change the batteries. Um, you make sure that smoke detector works. They save lives. Make sure everybody in the house knows to stop, drop, and roll if your clothing catches on fire. That's another one that the kids practice and that we don't as adults. Um, decide on where to meet outside the house. If there's a fire at night, and that's usually when fires occur, is at nighttime because we forgot to turn off the stove or blow out that candle. We've gone to sleep and so we don't notice that something is starting to smoke or smolder. Um, and so then the fire occurs at nighttime. Well, what happens when that fire breaks out, the smoke alarms are going off, and in your panic, everybody's running out different exit doors and going a different way. When the fire department rolls up, you want to have everybody out there in one place, your designated meeting place, so that when the fire department rolls up, you can say, we're out, we're safe, and they can go focus on putting out the fire. So, you know, the neighbor's mailbox across the street, right there across the street from your house, something like that, the, the tree at the end of your drive. Whatever it is, make sure everybody knows that if we evacuate because there's a fire in the home, this is where we're gonna be. So the fire department knows you're okay and they can get to saving your house. Um, evacuation, and Mike Lantier is gonna talk more about this during the fire section, but if you're forced to evacuate during a fire or after an earthquake, do not hesitate. If you are told by a firefighter or a police officer that you need to evacuate now, they mean now. It doesn't mean go get those 10 minute um, evacuation list items. It now means now. A wildland fire can outrun you. So you just need to go. Make sure you know your way around your neighborhood. If you have to evacuate by foot or by car, know two different ways out. Get to know your neighborhood. 
All right, so when you sit down with your family, you wanna talk about different places that you can meet up if you can't go home, um, if you're not able to get home or if you have to leave the house and you're not together at the time. What if you're not able to talk to each other on the phone and so you just need to be able to go someplace that's pre-designated? Have a few different places that you all know about, whether it be the coffee shop down the street, the playground that everybody knows that's, that's a few blocks away, but have a couple of different places so you know how to find each other even if you can't talk on the phone. And you wanna make sure you have a good communication plan. Um, if your power goes out, a lot of times you lose the house phone. Those cordless phones that we have at home, if you still have a house phone, uh, don't work if there's no electricity. So having an old fashioned phone that plugs into the jack and has the curly cord that comes up to your ear, those don't require electricity. So it's good to have one of those on hand. You wanna get old school, get a rotary phone. They'll work even without electricity. Um, if you have a landline, with your cell phones, we do rely on the towers. And one thing that we learned during the, the fires up in Sonoma County is a lot of the towers went down. And I actually have a relative who's um, pretty clever and he went and got a, a burner phone from, from CVS or 7-Eleven, one of those disposable phones. And the way those work is they go and use cell towers that are working, whatever's closest and available. They don't, they're not designated to any particular carrier, so they use whatever they can ping off of. And so he went and got some of these phones and my family was able to call me from a burner phone when their own cell phones didn't work. So maybe it's getting a burner phone. Um, a lot of times local phone service will get jammed up. And so you just can't make those local phone calls because it's just overloaded, everybody's busy. Uh, so having an out of area contact that can relay information is really good. So let's say all the local phone service is jammed up and we've had a major earthquake and I need to call my out of area contact to get information to my family. So my out of area contact, her name is Josie. She lives in Virginia, my old neighbor out there. I call Josie and I say, hey Josie, this is Lori. I'm fine. We just had a major earthquake. I'm fine. I'm going to work. Please tell my family when they call in to check in with you that I'm okay. I drive down to, to Tiburon. I get here. I call Josie back in Virginia. Hey Josie, it's Lori again. I've made it to work safely. Has my family phoned in? And she says, yes. Your mother and your sister both called. They're fine. They barely felt it where they live north of you. And now I'm able to work knowing that my family's okay and I can focus on doing what I can to help the peninsula. Have that out of area contact. Um, then make sure everybody knows that that's the out of area contact and make sure the out of area contact knows because all of a sudden they're gonna start getting a bunch of phone calls. Um, <clears throat> around here, we have lots of different forms of communication and you wanna make sure that you're ready to receive information. So while talking to your family is great, having good information to give them is very important too. So make sure you're signed up for all of the town or city e-bulletins, the e-newsletters that we put out. We use those a lot to send emergency information out. Uh, during this, this pandemic flu, um, we've had a lot of information go out through Tib Talk and the City of Belvedere e-newsletter to our residents, just getting information out to them. We also use Nextdoor um, as much as we can to try to pass along information. We also have our own radio station. We have SNAP 840 AM, and I try to update SNAP 840 as much as I possibly can. Anytime there's new information, I put it on the radio station. The radio is always going. Even if there's nothing going on in the world, there's always gonna be my voice talking on the radio station. So tune into 840 at any given time. It's a recorded message that I can record from my cell phone, from my house, from the road. <clears throat> and so you can always hear the recorded message. And make sure that you're signed up for Alert Marin. Alert Marin is, is the best way for us to get information out to the public. Uh, it allows us to send emergency notifications by your cell phone with a call or a text and by email and we can call your house phone. So go to alertmarin.org and register your information today and, um, and sign up for those alerts. It, it uses Nixel, it's the same kind of idea, but it's, it's actually better than Nixel. Um, and we use it just for emergencies. Make sure you have a good radio um, so that you can receive information by radio. So there's a lot of different kinds out there. Um, <clears throat> there's weather radios, there's, there's great, um, Cato is a good brand, and they'll get most radio stations that you need like um, KCBS, KGO, and the SNAP radio. So make sure you're ready to receive information on a radio. The best radio you have though is gonna be in your car. Your car is actually a great resource. You can go sit in your car, 
listen to the radio, get emergency information, plug your cell phone in and charge it up if you don't have electricity. Just make sure if you're sitting in your car with your car running, you're not in the garage with the door closed because then you end up with carbon monoxide, carbon dioxide poisoning. So um, make sure that you have the garage door open or have your car parked outside. Um, information on the Alert Marin system, again, register at alertmarin.org and we will use that to get information out on any kind of an emergency situation here on the Tiburon Peninsula. And we can send messages out through Alert Marin to just one neighborhood. We can do a, a specific geographic area. So if there's a water main break just in one neighborhood, we can send something out just to the affected neighborhood. Or if there's some kind of a criminal activity going on in, in just a particular neighborhood, we'll send it just there. So it's very specific emergency information for you at your location. Um, vital documents, make sure you have two copies of all your important documents. So this is gonna be the financial paperwork, the, the deed to your house, the title to your car, uh, medical information. You make sure you have all those things backed up somewhere. So if something does happen to your home, you'll still have those important documents someplace. One of the important documents should be an inventory of your home. It, is very, very beneficial to have a list of all of the um, expensive, uh, valuable items in your house. Put down serial numbers and makes and models of things if they need to be replaced um, for insurance purposes. Serial numbers come in handy too if anything gets stolen. It's good to have a copy of everything you have and then a backup copy someplace. That will help your insurance company down the road during the recovery process. Um, suggested storage sites for those backup copies of those documents, um, safety deposit box with a friend or relative at least 200 miles away at work. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a place at work that you can stash that thumb drive, you know, one of the things you can do too is back up copies of your photographs. Um, that's one of the things you always hear when people lose their homes is, you know, you lose all those photographs. Well, nowadays you can digitize everything, get them scanned in, digitize them, and put those backup copies of all those photographs someplace else so you don't lose all those memories. Uh, local school plan, our schools have great plans in place so that if something happens during school hours, they will take good care of the children until the children can be safely released to a parent or another designated person. Make sure you know um, what the school's plans are and make sure that you have somebody else designated to pick your child up and make sure that person knows that they're able to pick your child up. They're gonna be very strict about releasing kids they will only give them to somebody you designated. They're gonna ask for ID, and when that person goes to pick up your child, they are going to make sure they know exactly where that person takes your child. So if you show up at the school, they're gonna be able to say, your next door neighbor, Mrs. Smith, picked up Billy and took him to her house. And you'll know exactly that Billy is okay and you know exactly where he is. So make sure you know what the plan is with the school and make sure on your end, you have the designated people assigned and that they know their job. Make sure your child knows who they can go with as well. Um, insurance, make sure you know what kind of insurance you have. Know what your deductibles are. Make sure you have everything covered in your home that you want to have covered. Uh, we heard lots of sad stories out of Sonoma County. People didn't have enough insurance to cover their actual losses. They hadn't updated their, their policy in years and it was outdated. So sit down every year or two with your insurance agent, talk about your policy and make sure it's what you want. If you're renting, look into renter's insurance. It's very, very reasonably priced and well worth it. So we've talked about how to prepare yourself before the disaster. Now let's talk about what to do during the earthquake a little bit more. So the ground starts to shake. If you're inside, stay there. Believe it or not, being inside is actually safer than outside in most circumstances. So seek shelter underneath a big heavy desk or piece of furniture and duck cover and hold on to the piece of furniture. You wanna hold on to it so it doesn't bounce away. Remember like your house is on wheels, you don't want the table or desk to bounce away from you and leave you exposed, so hold on to it. Duck cover and hold. Um, if you don't have a big piece of furniture, again, find a safe area away from things that could fall down, like the big bookcases or, or pieces of art on the walls. Stay away from things that might fall down. If you have a doorway and you can get into a doorway safely, if that's the closest best option, get into a doorway. Just make sure you do it the right way. If a doorway is your closest best option, make sure that you do it the right way. So let me show you how to do the doorway thing. First off, Here's how you do it the wrong way. Do not get into the doorway when the ground is shaking like this. If you do this, 
the doorway, first off, can close on your fingers and slam, ouch, the thought of it. So then you're not very secure in here at all. And my face is exposed to things that might come falling down on me. So do not do this during an earthquake. The correct way to get into the doorway is put your backside up against the hinge side of the door and spread your legs a little bit. This is gonna keep the door from closing on you. If you then take your hands and put them on the other side and press, you're now in here very securely. Put your head down and that's gonna protect your face. If you have small children, put your children or your dog underneath your body and you've now created a nice little barrier and you'll all be safe in that doorway. If you have more than one child, you can fit multiple kids under here. Um, and I always point that out because during the 89 earthquake, I was sitting down on the couch with my mother and my sister and we were getting ready to watch the World Series. My mother was in the middle, I was to her right and my little sister was to the left. The ground started shaking and my mother took my sister to the doorway and didn't take me. And ever since that day, I've known who the favorite was. So don't pick and choose, take all your kids to the doorway with you. Um, if you're outside when the earthquake happens, try to move to an open area. Stay away from buildings, power lines, chimneys, things that might come falling down. Get to an open area. If you happen to be lucky enough to have a picnic table or something that you can duck cover and hold under, by all means do it. If you are downtown, uh, downtown San Francisco near tall buildings where glass is gonna be way up high and it might come falling down on you, it's actually safest to get inside the building and seek shelter underneath a big heavy um, piece of furniture or into a doorway. And then once you leave that, that building, make sure that you're very careful when you enter the street. Glass can continue to fall for, for some time after the earth has stopped shaking. There also could be cars out of control, power lines down. You really wanna be aware of your surroundings when you go back outside onto the street. If you're in a crowded public place, don't rush the door. There's always two ways in and out, so look for an alternate exit um, or stay in the center of the room. Don't get trampled on. If you're in a high-rise building, just be aware that the alarms could go off. You could start having loud sirens going off. It could be very scary. And then make sure you don't take the elevator. Use the stairs to exit once the ground has stopped shaking. If you're in your car, um, <clears throat> I've heard different stories from people that have gone through earthquakes in their car, and a lot of times you don't even realize you're having an earthquake. It feels like you're driving on flat tires. So if you have a feeling that you're having an earthquake because it suddenly feels you're on, like you're on four flat tires, Pull your car over to the side of the road, not near any power lines or trees. Set the emergency brake, put on your flashers, and cover yourself up until the shaking stops. Once the shaking stops, do not drive over any bridges or over any overpasses or under any overpasses until you know that they're safe. Now this could take hours. It might take some time for engineers to come out there and deem that a bridge is safe. Um, and so you might be stuck there. Find an alternate route, listen to emergency news, or maybe that's a time just to hunker down and hopefully you have a comfort item in your car kit. If you put a deck of cards or a crossword puzzle book, you know, sit down and, and try to just do something to kill the time until it's safe, but it's better than driving over an unsafe bridge. Immediately after an earthquake, <clears throat> you wanna check yourself and the people around you and make sure nobody's injured. If anybody's injured, you wanna give first aid attention as quickly as you can. You also want to check for that gas leak. If you have a gas leak, you really want to make sure you shut off the gas as quickly as possible. Don't go lighting any matches or flipping any light switches even until you know for a fact that your gas is secure. Um, check for any damage to your utilities. Check your building uh, for structural stability. Make sure you don't have huge cracks in your wall, that your doorways aren't crooked. Um, you want to make sure that your house is, is secure to be in and protect your water supply. Shut the water down. Uh, to protect the water supply inside the house if necessary. And if you have any doubt, you can turn it off and you can always turn it back on again. But basically, you're trying to make sure that your house is safe to be in because we want you to be able to shelter in place as long as it's safe there. We want you to shelter in place for as long as possible. You have your supplies, you've got your plans, hunker down and stay put. Kind of sounds like the COVID-19 response. Just stay put. It's safest in your home assuming again your house is safe so you want to make sure that you've cleaned up any hazardous materials any spilled chemicals underneath the kitchen sink any broken glass on the kitchen floor make sure you clean up any of those hazards 
If your kids were in school, you especially want to make sure you clean any of those things up before getting your kids and bringing them into an unsafe environment, which sounds difficult because your instinct is going to be to go get your children, but you want to bring them home to a safe environment. So make sure the house is prepared. Um, get your emergency supplies out, <clears throat> get your emergency kit, you know, make sure you have what you need. Turn on your radio, start listening for emergency information. If you are fortunate enough to have an organized block captain program, um, you know, check in with your block captain. If you've got neighbors that you check in on or, or elderly people, check in on them now. You know, make sure everybody's okay and then get ready for aftershocks. Aftershocks are gonna happen and you never know how big or when and sometimes they can even be bigger than the initial earthquake. We just saw that in Southern California um, last summer where there was an earthquake and the aftershock, there was one bigger than the initial quake. It could happen, be prepared. If your house is not safe, please know that while we do have plans in place to open up shelters, it's gonna take some time for a shelter to open up. We're gonna have to bring in resources and personnel and the Red Cross is going to assist us and it could take some time. So if your home is not safe to be in, pick up your emergency kit <clears throat> and go to a neighbor's house. And if you go to a neighbor's house and say, my house, the doorways are crooked and there's cracks in the wall and I don't think my house is on the foundation right anymore and I'm not safe being there. Can I stay with you? I have my own kit. I have water, I have Twinkies, I have everything I need. Can I just have some roof? I can't imagine any neighbor saying no. <clears throat> so pack up your stuff and go to a neighbor's house. Once you're there, start listening to 8.40 a.m. Start checking on next door. Look for in your emails for the e-bulletins. We will let you know when a shelter has been opened up and where you can go for assistance. Um, our shelters, they're gonna be designated based on where the need is and what facility is gonna be the best. It could be any church, any school, any public building. So we just don't know which one, it'll be decided at the time which one is gonna best suit our needs. Here's some pictures on page 30 of examples of damages to houses. Um, the walls get cracked, doorways crooked, windows broken, roofs become compromised. Things that will let you know that maybe your house has shifted off the foundation and it's not safe. And that's when you want to, to go over to your neighbor's house. Alrighty, so how do we get ready for fire? Um, this section here is gonna cover how we can prepare for fire season and what to do if we actually are faced with a fire in our neighborhood. So with that, let's talk about when the flames come. When there are actually flames in your neighborhood, you need to get out and get out fast. If they are right there and the fire department tells you to evacuate, the time to go is now. Um, if you do have time before you evacuate, there are things you can do to prepare, but when the time comes and the flames are actually in your neighborhood and it's time to go, you need to go. Um, if there is time before you evacuate, if the fire is, let's say, a mile away, you want to make sure that you're doing everything you can to be prepared. So first off, start following what's going on with the fire. Tune into the local news stations, to the local 840 AM radio station, talk to your neighbors, and stay on top of what's going on on the situation. And then, you know, let your neighbors know what's going on. If they don't know what's going on, make sure you tell them. We're all in this together. So alert them so that they can start making preparations as well. Um, if there's time before you evacuate, that's when you assemble your, your 10 minute evacuation list items. Um, so this is a list of items that you have prepared in advance that are irreplaceable items. Um, and this is the time when you would want to assemble those. If you have 10 minutes or more um, before you have to evacuate, that's when you wanna put together those essential items that you're gonna be taking with you. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in a second. Um, this is also when you want to get dressed in long pants, cotton or wool clothing, sturdy shoes, and get yourselves prepared to evacuate. Those N95 masks or similar face covers, that's when you want to have those as well. Uh, they're not just good for the pandemic, they're also good for smoky environments to, to protect your lungs. So make sure you have those masks in your kit because now's a good time to pull them out. Um, if you have pets, you want to make sure you get your pets confined. Uh, dogs and cats, if you're running around and, and trying to scramble to get those 10 minute evacuation items together and you're prepping your house, they're gonna be upset too. So make sure you get them confined before you start doing all that. Put them in the car, they'll be safe out there at least. Um, if there's time to prepare your home before you go, remove all the flammable items away from the windows. Uh, things that are, are close to the window can actually 
from the heat outside catch on fire and you'd want to try to slow the flames down. So take the curtains off of the windows and, and move those, those flammable items towards the center of the room. Close all the interior doors inside your home. Anything you can do to slow that fire down. Um, connect your garden hoses to outside faucets and put ladders and shovels and rakes outside. That's if you have a lot of time. Our fire department has great tools on their fire engines and so they're prepared to come in with their tools. But if you have a lot of time and you wanna leave those things out there handy for them, that's always appreciated. But they do have a lot of, a lot of good stuff. Um, protecting yourself from fire before the flames even are there. There's a lot of things that you can do to protect your home. Um, first and foremost, make sure you have good working smoke detectors and that you have those outside of every bedroom and outside of the kitchen and make sure that the batteries are always good. Every time you change the clocks, change the batteries or look into the new smoke detectors that have the, the 10 year battery um, and, and make sure when you test your, your um, smoke detector, it's not just for the batteries, just to make sure that smoke detector is working properly because sometimes the smoke detector themselves will give out. So you're not just changing those batteries, you're testing it to make sure the smoke detector itself works. Um, make sure you're just aware of what's going on with your house. Go around and look at the cords and make sure you don't have any other, you know, electrical hazards or fire hazards in your home. Make sure you're being safe and there's, there's nothing that's going to, that's going to cause a fire. Um, and make sure you work with your neighbors to encourage neighborhood cooperation with your vegetation management. Working with neighbors is very important. Uh, you also want to make sure that on hand you have a good fire extinguisher. So have a good working fire extinguisher. There are different kinds out there. This is kind of a heavy duty one. Um, I, I really like this one. There's little ones out there too, little one use um, that are good for, for your car kit maybe. Um, they have sometimes gauges on them that tell you if they're good or not. The, the good fire extinguishers can actually be serviced. Um, you can annually get them serviced and keep them going for, for a long time. Um, to use a fire extinguisher, you're going to pull the pin out of the fire extinguisher. Pull the pin, you're going to aim at whatever's on fire. So let's say my garbage can is down here. I'm not going to aim at the flames that are up here. I'm going to aim at whatever's on fire down in the trash can. So I'm going to pull the pin, I'm going to aim at what's on fire, I'm going to squeeze the trigger, it's squeeze the trigger and sweep back and forth. So pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep at whatever is on fire. And that's how you use a fire extinguisher. Make sure you know how to use that fire extinguisher before you actually need to use it. Um, the best thing you can do to protect your home is having good vegetation management, good defensible space. And there's a lot of information out there um, at the, the fire department's website, the um, Fire Safe Marin website, a lot of good information out there on how to create good defensible space, how to use vegetation management to eliminate those, those flammable plants. Um, you know, make sure that you keep things watered, make sure you prune the dead branches and dried trees back from your home. Um, any vegetation in your yard, make sure you space it to create fuel breaks. Um, and you wanna make sure that all the dried brush is cleared back at least 30 to 100 feet from your home. Make sure you clear all of the dead pine needles and tree leaves out of your rain gutters. You know, clean those rain gutters in the summertime as well as the winter to make sure that all that dried flammable material is cleared out from your roof in case an ember were to fly over. <clears throat> um, home maintenance and construction, you wanna make sure you have really easy to read numbers outside of your home. And this is not just for our fire department. Our fire department knows our, our whole community so well that if you told them your address, they could probably tell you what, their what your house looks like. But if we have a large scale fire, we're gonna be requesting mutual aid. We're gonna have firefighters coming from all over the state of California possibly. And they don't know our streets as well. So having those easy to read numbers out front makes it easy for the firefighters or police officers to find your home quickly. Um, make sure that you have spark arresters on your chimney. That's actually a, a requirement. So make sure you have those spark arresters. So if you do use your fireplace, no embers will fly out of your chimney. And if you're going to be doing any kind of a remodel or building a new home, make sure that you incorporate good um, practices when you're remodeling and you can get lots of new ideas from, from the fire department or their website.
So fire season is coming, so make sure that you prepare. Um, and if you have any questions, give the fire department a call or log on to their website for more information. Winter storms. This is something we face every year. There's always challenges involved with landslides and power outages. And so we have to be prepared every single year for the potential of having a severe storm. When the water comes, um, if you're in an area that is likely to flood, make sure you know where sandbags are. Uh, we've been doing sandbag locations at the Marsh Road parking lot by the tennis courts, also at Blackie's Pasture in the overflow lot. There are sandbag locations. You do have to scoop the bags yourself, but the bags, the sand, and the shovels are all there. So if you're in an area likely to flood before the storm comes, go out, get sandbags, and you can help protect yourself. Um, if you're also in an area where there's likely to be runoff, you can go out and get plastic sheeting and lumber and help protect your home as best you can. But you want to do that before the storm comes. On page 39, there's a guide on how to stack your sandbags properly so that you can best keep the water out. Landslides are, al are always our big concern. Uh, land movement, once it gets going, it doesn't stop and mud earth it's heavy and it's very very deadly and we have had people down here in southern Marin <clears throat> and on the Tiburon Peninsula have lost lives so if you see the earth moving you see a hill actually shifting downward towards you evacuate make sure you know how to evacuate out of your yard your home and out of the area then call 911 if you have any concerns about a hillside in your area before the storm comes, you just have concerns, please call our building, our, our um, public works departments. Our public works departments will have somebody come out there and take a look, and if there's anything that we can do to, to secure the hillside, they can rec make recommendations or even assist you. So make sure if you have a potential for a landslide, you notify some, some licensed engineers or the building officials so they can come out there and, and help you. Um, during storms, a lot of times we do lose electricity, and so you want to be prepared for the electrical outages. This is also going to apply to during our public safety power shutoffs that we could see during fire season. So you really want to be prepared for life without power. Um, I kind of spoke earlier about making sure you have good lighting. Um, lanterns, good size camping lanterns are great for lighting up full rooms. Uh, make sure that you have you know, a barbecue, flashlights, things on hand that are gonna help you make it through a few days without electricity even. If you come across a downed power line, whether you think it's live or not, treat it as though it is. Call 911 and get out of the area. Police department will come out, secure the area until PG&E can come out. Um, if you have a generator that can help run things in your house, talk to PG&E or get information from the PG&E website so that you can make sure to learn how to properly use it so that you bypass the, the main power lines and you don't cause any uh, harm to any of the PG&E workers that are working on the lines in your area. If you have a fireplace, make sure that you only burn logs or newspaper um, in there. Do not ever put charcoal in your fireplace. That also creates carbon monoxide and is very, very poisonous. Uh, make sure you know how to disconnect your electric garage door to work it manually. And this was something that came up during the the fire evacuations, people that could not quickly open up their garage doors when they had lost power so that they could evacuate. Um, it came up a lot during the PSPSs last year with the power outages, people that couldn't get out of their, their garages because it was a manual garage door. Make sure you know how to open it manually and if you're not physically able to, come up with a plan with a neighbor, uh, a neighbor that can maybe open up your garage door. If it is a planned power outage, Put your car in the driveway. Make sure you keep the doors locked, but put your car in the driveway so that if you do need to get out, you don't even have to worry about the garage door. Uh, living in a disaster area. This was down after the, the 1989 earthquake in Watsonville. They just had big tent city set up and they had showering, um, big rig trailers came in with, with showers and tents where people could get supplies. And you know, that could be what we have for a shelter. If none of our buildings was safe, they could pull in something like this and set up at McKegney Green. I don't think they will, but you know, this is the kind of thing that sometimes you have to think outside the box. Maybe your plan A and your plan B and your plan C aren't possible. So you kind of have to think outside the box and that's what they did in Watsonville. So living in a disaster area, first off sanitation. If you don't have running water in your home, you can actually 
kind of makeshift toilets. Um, this is my very well-loved garbage bag roll. Um, a garbage bag can line a toilet bowl. You can do your business and then tie it up and then get it way far away from your living area. So you can line a toilet bowl. They also, I kind of showed one of my five gallon buckets earlier. Five gallon bucket, you can put your supplies in. They actually do make toilet seat lids and they make a plastic liner to go in here so you can have a makeshift toilet. So different options if you don't have running water for, for making yourself a, a toilet. Um, whenever it's possible, dispose of your garbage, um, but at least make sure you get it out of your living area. Again, we want you sheltering in place. It's gonna seem like you're in a confined space. I think we all know how that feels right now, but just make sure you get it far away from your living area. You don't want it around your, your food. Um, using your emergency food. First, you're gonna use all of your perishables from the refrigerator and then the freezer, and then you can hit the pantry and then your disaster or earthquake supplies, emergency supplies. Me personally, I'm probably gonna hit the Twinkies first because again, I'm big on the comfort foods, comfort items. You'd be amazed at how we feel during emergencies and anything you can do to calm yourself down, whether it be that activity or a comfort food, um, you know, go for it. But so use those perishables first, then your non-perishables from the pantry or your emergency kit. My stomach just growled at the thought of a Twinkie. Isn't that terrible? Um, pets, if you do have pets and your home's not safe to be in, a safe place might be your car. Um, the Humane Society in Marin County is also absolutely fantastic and they're gonna be providing shelter and um, assistance to anybody with pets, they'll help them be aware that they may or may not be allowed inside of a shelter. So have some kind of a backup plan for, for pets if you have them. Um, recovery. Make sure you document all of your damages as best you can. Take pictures, get signed statements from, from neighbors. Um, you know, yes, I swear Lori had a bright red Ferrari before all this. Whatever it takes to document it. Um, but keep copies of all receipts, document everything. This is where that household inventory comes in handy. You can say, hey, I had all of these items and here's receipts and makes and models and whatever you had before, it's gonna be real helpful with the recovery. Um, if your home does require repairs, make sure that you get a licensed contractor, ask for references, and if they tell you they need all the money, all the cash up front, find somebody else. You don't need to pay them everything up front. You wanna make sure you're not gonna get somebody that's gonna take advantage because unfortunately, it does happen. So um, the psychological damage of, of disasters. Disasters are terrifying. Um, what we're going through right now with, with the COVID-19, it's scary and it's causing a lot of stress and anxiety to people that don't even necessarily usually get stress and anxiety. It's amazing what disasters will do to a person. They make us act differently than we normally do on a day-to-day -day basis. So the most calm person in the world might become hysterical. Um, it's very, very, very important to be patient with yourself, be patient with your loved ones, talk about your feelings. Try to get into some kind of a near normal routine. Get yourself into a routine, do things that make you feel like you. Um, you know, I had mentioned, you know, if you're into knitting, put a, a knitting needle and some yarn in your kit, crossword puzzles or um, Sudoku or whatever it is that you like to do, get into a into a habit of doing it, you know? For, for me, it's gonna be throw on a baseball game or, or something that's gonna make me feel good um, and make me feel like me. But be patient with yourself and do something that feels normal um, and, and just hang in there. Um, this is some of the people that helped put this program together and I always like to give them a little bit of credit. Dr. Tom Cromwell worked with Ed Lynch from the fire department, um, Larry Smith, Joy Kuhn, P.D. Stein, who's not in here, just phenomenal neighbors of ours that put this whole program together because they care about their neighbors. And really, that is such a huge component of this program. Work with your neighbors. Um, they're gonna be your closest ally in all of this. They're gonna be there before the first responders, before your best friend that lives 50 miles away. Work with your neighbors and um, we'll get through everything. If you have any questions at all, you can email me or call me or call the fire department if you have questions for them. My contact information, um, grab a pen and a pencil. My email address is L, like Lori Nilsen, and I L S E N at tiburonpd.org. Best way to get a hold of me. Um, and I'll make sure that that contact information is available here too. So thank you very much for your time. And if you have any questions, we're always here for you. Hi. 
I'm Alex Winter. I helped create our new and redesigned Tiburon Emergency Preparedness website. If you still feel unprepared or want further disaster information after this course, you can learn more by visiting the Get Ready 94920 tab on townoftiburon.org. In addition to this class, the Get Ready 94920 website is a great resource for emergency preparedness information. The site contains important disaster material, preparedness checklists, and suggestions for emergency readiness. There is information about what to do before, during, and after all types of major emergencies, including public safety power shutoffs. By educating yourself and your family, you can ensure that you will be ready and prepared to be safe in the event of a future disaster.